Well, thanks for that. I get the just the, the wonderful privilege of introducing you here to our to my colleagues uh, all over the place, and it really is a privilege. Uh, so thanks to Ted, to the folks at Nick Shippo, and to you, Congresswoman. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jeff Pappas, and I'm the State Historic Preservation Officer here in New Mexico, and I am uh, I've been tasked to introduce. Congresswoman Fernandez from my home state and also from my district, District 3, I mean, uh, here in Northern New Mexico. Uh, Congresswoman Fernandez is a native New Mexican. She was raised in Las Vegas, New Mexico, went to high school, in fact, at West Las Vegas High School, uh, and then went to Yale where she studied Latin American history at Yale, and then she went off to to Stanford Law uh, to get her JD. And then she sort of hung around DC for a while and then in Northern California and the work she did as a White House fellow. But ultimately though, and fortunately uh, for the state of New Mexico, Congresswoman Fernandez came back to her home state uh, and she then began a, a just a marvelous career working for Nordhaus Law here in Santa Fe where she represented uh, native issues all over the state. And, and that's really where she has made her reputation uh, as a lawyer and as an advocate uh, for the Native American peoples and communities here in New Mexico. And that really ought to serve you well as you continue your work in Congress, specifically with the subcommittee for indigenous, indigenous peoples. Uh, 24 years, 25 years or so working for Nordhaus, uh, she then was appointed uh, to the board of the advisory council, the start preservation under the Obama administration, where she was then, where she became vice chair uh, in 2015, I believe, I can remember my dates correct, or 2016, right around there. And she served uh, you know, for the ACHP, coming back again to the state of New Mexico, where she began her own uh, sort of law practice under ledger law and strategy, where she continued uh, to do wonderful social aspect or uh, impact types of issues here getting involved in sustainability uh, and environmental issues, which will be critical again when you continue your work with the resource committee in the House of Representatives. Uh, in 2020, uh, it seems like you decided to run for Congress uh, and I watched your campaign uh, very, very closely and, and you ran a wonderful, wonderful campaign. Uh, assuming the, uh, the third congressional district here in New Mexico from Representative Lujan, who later went on to uh, take the seat in the U.S. Senate with uh, Senator Tom Udall's retirement. And, uh, and that's where we stand. And I just welcome you to Nick Shippo, uh, to this wonderful group here that's been gathered uh, every year. We talk about preservation issues that are important to all of us. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you so much and take it away, Congresswoman. Well, thank you so much, Jeff Papas, for that introduction. And thank you for the work that you do. Um, you know, New Mexico has great history and we have great professionals dedicated uh, to present. I thought it was unmuted. Okay, Did, I'll, I'll start again. I was thanking Jeff Papas for that wonderful work that he's done as well as his introduction. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, I'm so proud of what we've done in New Mexico from, you know, uh, from Mount Taylor to our wonderful women's historic marker project. Uh, some of those of which I've been part of, uh, uh, our State Historic Preservation Office has definitely been part of them as well. So I also want to thank the State Historic Preservation Association. You know, thank you for inviting me here today um, to muse with you about the direction of historic preservation in this historic moment of time. You know, while I can't see each of you, uh, I know that I consider you like, I have my democracy warriors, well, you're my history warriors, right? You're gonna serve our country well because you help preserve our history and therefore our soul. And we're in a moment of, you know, saving the soul of America, you are at the vanguard of that. Because when I hear stories that we are a hopelessly divided country and our divisions are too broad to be bridged, I disagree. 
because in each of you, I know, beats a heart dedicated to preserving the diverse stories of our beautifully diverse American communities. So one of my favorite poems is Bursiaga's You Insult Me When You Call Me Schizophrenic. My divisions are infinite. In this single poetic line, we capture the concept of a kaleidoscope of diversity sublimely and proudly existing in the identity of a single person. Similarly, the United States has infinite stories of struggle, of conflict, of historical trauma, and of cultural celebration. Your work as state historic preservation officers is at the forefront of saving those stories to help us engage in and let's be honest with each other. They are difficult questions. They are difficult conversations about who we have been, about what we have done, but we engage in those conversations so that we can become something even better. So I'm a 17th generation Nuevo Mexicana on my European and Sephardic side, right? which over 17 generations and beyond is also inclusively indigenous. But in the most recent past, I'm also the daughter of Manuelita de Atocha Lucero Ledger and Ray Ledger. They were pioneers in bilingual education who helped pass the 1973 Bilingual Multicultural Education Act by which Tewa, Tewa, Toa, Keras, Navajo, Apache, Zuni, and Spanish must be taught in our schools. So as a young girl, I remember the poets and musicians and activists flowing in and out of our home because my parents understood keenly the need to preserve our language as a necessary ingredient for nuestra herencia, nuestra cultura, y nuestra identidad. So having a strong historical identity, I think, even when it includes historical trauma, and by that, I mean the knowledge that you are a descendant of both the conquerors and the conquered that you have inherited from both the oppressed and the oppressor, that that's actually a gift. It's also a gift for community because if after acknowledging those conflicts, you can like yourself, like what you and your community have become, it is that much easier to like others. Then it's a teeny step to be curious about others and to delight in their difference. So this, this idea of delighting in the difference of others is actually the opposite, right, of othering. It's the opposite of demonizing others as we have seen too often in the last few years. Instead of othering, it's becoming. This becoming allows us to then celebrate each other's difference. So that gift of knowledge of the complexities of our past as it lives in places, even when, or most importantly, when it is not, when it is not an idyllic past, is what each of you preserves for our country. You help us become a nation of curiosity and celebration. So my hope is actually that we linger. I know most people don't want this, but I think you do and I do is that we linger in this difficult moment of racial reckoning so that we stay in this time of evaluating our monuments and our stories long enough to grapple with the hard questions and intense community discussions that are required for us to move into a more equitable and just phase of our history. So I don't know if I'm the first former ACHP member to serve or to be elected uh, in, to Congress, but I can tell you that my experience in cultural preservation informs so much of what I have hope to do here. Um, so I'll share a few of those experiences that are now part of my congressional to-do list. So one is doing Zuni Preblo's opposition to the Fence Lake coal mine. And for those of you who aren't from New Mexico, what that was, was there was a proposed coal mine that had the potential of destroying Zuni Salt Lake, which was key to Zuni's religion and culture, but also a sanctuary for all other tribes in the region. I was lucky in that I was asked to present the testimony of the Pueblo of Laguna's cultural and experts, uh, leaders in support of Zuni. But I, you know, I learned tons from that experience, right? Which could be, you know, another speech altogether, like what the war chiefs taught me about how we look at life. But I, what I wanted to highlight today is the frustration that so many of us felt on the part of the Zuni side for it to combat the mine 
SUNY had to go to the expense of hiring its own hydrogeologist and engage in years of legal battle. So after that experience, my own travel clients, when I was at Ledger Law and Nordhaus, as Jeff mentioned, we always charged an application fee to anyone who wanted a lease or right of the land. So we had the resources to hire our own experts. And we always made sure to charge enough so we got the experts we wanted and we needed. So imagine if that were always the case. Imagine that were always the case, that state and tribal historic preservation officers had sufficient resources to truly and independently evaluate the potential impact of a project on traditional cultural properties, right? Imagine. Another instance is I was the ACHP vice chair when we issued a letter to the Army Corps of Engineers noting that a permit for the Dakota Access Pipeline was premature because there had been inadequate tribal consultation and investigation of impact on TCPs. We all have the images, right? The images of the powerful collective action at Standing Rock um, that came next when that letter was pretty much ignored, right? And we all experienced the heartbreak as the pipeline was green-lighted by the Trump administration and the peaceful protesters came under attack and were dispersed. So imagine if the act had better protections, more teeth as it were, so that a project would have been properly evaluated with the cumulative impacts of the entire pipeline on the cultural properties before any ground was broken. So I've come to Congress at a historic time. You know, our nation is confronting multiple crises, the pandemic, the climate crisis, racial reckoning, economic inequity, and the need to climb out of a recession. We recognize that bold action is needed and we have two years to act boldly. I'm elected for two years and two years only, but bold action also means lots of development, which means your offices are gonna be so very busy. So then we have to ask, do you have the resources you need? Imagine if in these two years, we were able to get you the resources you needed, but we also took up the permanent and full funding of the Historic Preservation Fund, similar to how we passed the Great American Outdoors Act to permanently fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We should not wait until it expires in 2023, right? We should act now so that you are fully prepared to meet this historic moment we are living. Well, I can imagine these legislative improvements. I need to ask you all a favor because you're the experts on whom I must rely for the ideas, for the solutions, for the stories of what could be and what should be. So I've come to describe a Congresswoman's roles in my flopping you know, seven weeks that I've served as we're a fisherwoman or a gatherer of problems. We gather ideas and solutions. So I'm asking you to bring me your stories, bring me your problems, bring me your ideas and solutions so that we all can act boldly together. So muchísimas gracias a todos por invitarme. Thank you so much for having me here with you today. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman uh, Laguerre, uh, Laguerre Fernandez. That was outstanding and especially appreciated uh, the call for full funding for the HPF and for reauthorization uh, before it expires in uh, 2023. That, uh, and I don't know if you are the first uh, former ACHP board member to be in Congress, but we are, we are pleased to have somebody who we don't actually need to explain what the Historic Preservation Fund is, or we don't have to explain uh, what TCPs are or what Section 106 is. It is, it makes, it's an incredible pleasure. So greatly appreciate that. Um, want to see, do we have any uh, questions uh, from the audience that uh, somebody uh, would like to ask? A lot of, uh, Julianne Polanco, who I, I know you were reaching out to, uh, she was, uh, uh, the way the Zoom was set up, uh, she was muted, but uh, she has spoken uh, very highly of you and also specifically wanted to uh, thank uh, Chris and Nathan on your staff for making this happen. It is, you know, from I'm someone who's been in uh, DC since 1999, and it is always a pleasure to deal with uh, with good staff, and always a reflection on uh, the member uh, that um, that they're working for. Just that uh, their their diligence to making sure that we got the uh, the technology right, but also making sure in these tough times that we got this on your schedule. Uh, was greatly appreciated. 
Um, unless there are any questions, there's a lot of appreciation uh, for your comments, uh, but uh, not seeing uh, any questions here. Uh, so let me say this then, I will pass on the thanks. I agree completely. I have a mar marvelous staff. I'm, uh, we intend to get a lot done together. So I meant it, reach out to me, uh, uh, everybody. You can go on my website. Hey, go on my website anyway and sign up. Uh, we, have, uh, we can't talk to anybody unless they actually sign up on my website because we'll let you know what we're doing every week, You know what I'm introducing. Uh, some of those things will be very attuned to some of your issues, uh, some of them might not, but you might say, hey, what are they doing <laughs> in Congress? Um, but, you know, reach out uh, to my staff because I do need to know, like, what are some of what are some of the things that people are working on the ground when I was running, right? I ran on this um, idea of protecting what we love because anytime we love something, you're going to protect it with the fierceness of a mama bear protecting her cubs, right? But that also my experience of on the ground projects really helped me understand what are the obstacles. Like when you're trying to build something, you know what's not working and what is working. And basically the state historic preservation officers are on the ground, they're working with people trying to build things and they know where they went into troubles. And so I need to, I need to hear those stories uh, to be able to actually do my work well. Thank you. Uh, we will definitely be in touch. And uh, as uh, the Congresswoman said, uh, go if you go to her website and sign up. Also, if you follow her on Facebook, all of that, you'll get a sense of the work that she's doing. And uh, this is clearly, um, clearly someone who understands historic preservation and cares about it. And thank you for your time, because I know even with, uh, if anything, uh, the way things are, it is, uh, with the pandemic, things are harder, not easier. So uh, the time that you've spent with us is greatly appreciated. I saw a question from, was it April about, I mean, stories in the nation, right? Uh, the great thing is that, you know, I represent, you know, I, my, as, as the speaker likes to say, your, your job description is in the title. I represent my district, but I sit in Congress and that impacts the nation. And so those things need, you know, I need to understand what's happening across the nation as well as in my district. Thank you. We, uh, we're going to go into a conversation with uh, Congresswoman Terry Sewell, similar situation. Um, her district is frequently referred to as uh, the civil rights district includes Selma, Birmingham, but as uh, she always makes clear, uh, the work that she's doing about preserving sites associated with civil rights and HBCUs goes far beyond her district. So I appreciate that point. Thank you for your time and we will absolutely uh, stay in touch with you and uh, thank your staff too. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye everybody. All right, Ted, we're ready whenever you are. Our speakers are both here. Outstanding. Uh, thank you. Can you see me, Bree? Yes. Yes. Okay, outstanding. Couldn't see myself. Thank you. You um, going to have uh, Clara Nobles from the Alabama SHPO introduce uh, Congresswoman Terry Sewell. Good afternoon, everyone. As Ted said, I'm Clara Nobles, the Deputy Director for the Alabama SHPO Office, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Terry Sewell from Alabama, my home state. Congresswoman Terry Sewell is in her sixth term representing Alabama's 7th Congressional District. She is one of the first women elected to Congress from Alabama in her own right and, and is the first Black woman to ever serve in the Alabama Congressional Delegation. Congresswoman Sewell sits on the House Ways and Means Committee and brings to the committee her more than 15 years of experience as a security and public finance attorney. Currently in the 117th Congress, she sits on three subcommittees, the Subcommittee on Health, the Subcommittee on Trade, and the Subcommittee on Worker and Family Support. In her short time in Congress, Represent Congresswoman Sewell has had several leadership positions, including freshman class president in the 112th Congress, 
The current term, she was selected by the Democratic leadership to serve as deputy chief deputy whip and sits on the steering and policy committee, which sets up policy directions for the Democratic caucus. Congresswoman Sewell is a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, where she is co-chair of the Voting Rights Task Force. She is a member of the New Democratic Coalition, co-chair of the Congressional Voting Rights Caucus, vice chair of the Congressional HBCU Caucus, and co-chair of the Rural Caucus, a proud product of Alabama's rural Black Belt. Congresswoman Sewell was the first Black valedictorian of Selma High School. She is an honors graduate of Princeton University and Oxford University in England and received her law degree from Harvard Law. I give you Congressman Sula. Thank you so much, Clara. What a great uh, introduction. Um, delivered the way my mother probably wrote it. <laughs> but thank you so much. And I wanna thank you for all that you do in our state uh, to help preserve our history. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Sewell. Greatly appreciate you taking the time to uh, be with our members today. Know that um, at the moment, one of the top priorities, I think you are voting later today is obviously combating the coronavirus pandemic and strengthening other se sectors of the economy that have been damaged by the pandemic. But uh, nevertheless, I know you consider investing in historic preservation and historic resources uh, the preservation of historic resources to be a priority, both for the Seventh District of Alabama and for the country. Uh, can you tell me about why during these tough times, funding historic preservation is possibly more important than it's ever been? Well, first, let me just thank you all for the invitation to speak today. You know, uh, historic preservation is so critically important to the district that I represent. I proudly represent my home district I grew up in this district. In fact, I uh, interned for a member, of, my member of Congress in a, while I was in college. He was Richard Shelby. He's now my United States Senator, but he was my congressman uh, back then. He was a Democrat back then too. I'm now dating myself. I'm not 30 years old. Um, but at the, uh, I say that to say that I represent Alabama's civil rights district, Birmingham, Montgomery, my hometown of Selma, Alabama. And I think that nothing is more important uh, and when I think about economic revitalization of those areas, then historic preservation of civil rights sites. And so uh, I see this not only as an important uh, link to our history and our past, but also uh, important economic driver for um, the district that I represent and the cities that I represent. Uh, so it's been my honor to, um, to time and time again, year in and year out, uh, go on the floor of Congress to increase the amount of um, appropriations for civil rights sites uh, through the National Park Service um, and the Department of Interior. Uh, likewise, I'm very pleased that we were able to extend uh, the civil rights, preservation of civil rights sites grants uh, to historically black colleges. I have seven of those in my district, um, including my mom and dad's alma mater, the Alabama State University, go Hornets. I wouldn't have had an opportunity to go to an Ivy League school had my parents not been first generation educated at historically black colleges. Um, and there are lots of historic sites and preservation on these uh, HBCU sites. I can think of the fact that uh, Alabama State and its students and its uh, faculty members were critically important in the Montgomery bus boycott. And in fact, held certain mass meetings on the campus of Alabama State University so extending the, the preservation of civil rights sites uh, to include those civil rights sites on HBCU campuses is critically important. And the fact that we've been able to get more resources uh, each appropriation season lately um, has been really important given that uh, so much has been stagnant. Um, and so I, uh, I take seriously the fact that I not only get to represent my home district, but I get to uh, make sure that my home, the legacy that is my home district is preserved for future generations. Thank you. Uh, greatly appreciate uh, those comments. And just, you know, what I did not realize that there were, uh, I think you said seven HBCUs within Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I have Stillman College in my district. Mm -hmm. I have Selma University in my district. I have Miles College in my district. Mm -hmm. In fact, Miles College recently received one of the HBCU uh, preservation grants, $499,000 to renovate mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, dormitories on the campus of Miles College, uh, where so many uh, civil rights activists, students, and faculty members were involved in the Children's Crusade as a part of uh, the civil rights movement in Birmingham, Alabama. So, you know, that dorm um, has historic significance, but it's also a critical way for HBCUs to get financing that they need for a lot of the deferred maintenance that so many structures <laughs> and sites often have. Um, this is a wonderful way for us to leverage federal resources to preserve our past, but more importantly, uh, to make sure that these buildings are there for future generations to be educated in. Outstanding. Uh, definitely appreciate the comments on uh, Williams Hall at Miles College and just in general uh, beyond um, uh, some, of the, some of the iconic sites that we know within uh, your district. Why is it um, so important that some of the lesser known sites in the civil rights movement that those also uh, get preserved besides, once again, besides some of you know, obviously, um, not obviously, uh, everyone should be aware of, uh, you know, uh, of the Montgomery bus station and what happened there. But why is it important that the lesser sites that maybe we haven't read about in history books, that those also get preserved? Well, I think it's uh, important that we uh, preserve um, the legacy that is a civil rights movement in my district. But I know that throughout America, there are important um, historic, from a historic pers per, um, perspective, historic sites all around. And I think that it's important um, that our states and our federal government invest in the, the preservation of history. Um, as it's often said, that if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat your history. Um, and I know that there are many known sites in my district that have received grants, both state and federal grants, like the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, where the four little girls were bombed uh, mm -hmm. in 1963, simply for going to church. And it was that national news, those headlines, the bodies of four little girls who were sacrificed, that really showed the racial hatred and racial terrorism that was present in America, not abroad, but right in our own backyard, that really led to the Civil Rights, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 being passed. Um, but I also know that there are really pivotal churches that are lesser known, like Bethel, like, um, um, you know, um, the, the, the uh, Tabernacle Church in Selma, Alabama. People know about Brown Chapel because that's where the, the marchers gathered before they marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But recently, Tabernacle, Tabernacle Baptist Church in Selma got a grant. It's not known as much, except those of us who grew up in Selma and those of us who are historians of the movement know that the first mass meetings were held at Tabernacle Church. So I think it's important that we get our history right. And I think that it's important that we involve the very institutions and the people who were involved in these impactful uh, sites um, to get their oral history as well. Uh, if we don't tell our stories, then others will tell them and they may not get it right. And I think part of, part of being a preservationist is to try to get the right story and the complete story. And so while there are very known um, civil rights activists like Martin Luther King and, and uh, Coretta, you know, um, Rosa Parks, people don't know of Reverend F.D. Reese, but he was one of the courageous eight in Selma, Alabama. He was my high school principal, actually. Um, but at the time in the 60s, he was president of the African-American Teachers League, and he was president of the Dallas County Voter League. And that Voter League was, uh, as president, he was the one who drafted the letter that was sent to Martin Luther King and to SNCC, inviting them to come to Selma, saying that, that Selma was the right place uh, to ignite uh, the voting rights movement, given that the African-American population in that county was large and that the percentage of, of those who were able to vote was small. And we also had uh, a sheriff kind of like, uh, 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 his name was Jim Clark, but he was 
kind of like Bull Connor in, in, in Birmingham and um, was a lightning rod. And so I think what people don't realize is just how strategic and how uh, the, the civil rights leaders were. Um, it wasn't by happenstance that things uh, you know, uh, occurred, but they were real tacticians. And the genius, the genius of it was that it was a nonviolent movement uh, in the face of the violence and the ra racial hatred that others perpetuated. So um, a roundabout way of saying that I think that we have to get our history right and correct. And um, you know, otherwise we often have revisionist history that may not necessarily tell the complete story. And so, you know, I, I often tell my colleagues who don't want to remember what happened in Alabama um, and the role that Alabama played um, in the civil rights and voting rights movement and why that was because of the bigotry and the Jim Crow segregation and, and the like. But I think it's important that we understand um, our history and that we tell our stories uh, because others would uh, tell them and they, they may not get it right. So I, I think that um, I often say you can't, you can't run away from your past. Uh, I think that we need to embrace it and leverage it for economic development, for historic preservation of these sites, uh, at, for an opportunity that we um, know our history and you know, we don't uh, repeat, repeat our history, it's important that we tell those stories. Thank you, that uh, really appreciate those points. And you know, as you said, Bolo, uh, Bolo, Bull Connor or Sheriff Bull Connor is someone that everyone has heard, but uh, Jim- Never Clark, heard of Jim Clark, but you know, that he was the one who sort of led he was Dallas County's sheriff. And, you know, I, I think that uh, that's why I'm so passionate about making sure that my little hometown gets a national, um, you know, voting rights museum that the National Park Service, mm -hmm. as a part of telling the story of America, that we memorialize and we uh, do so in a permanent way, um, the very important role that Selma, the city of Selma and Alabama uh, played in the voting rights movement and civil rights movement, and that those stories are worthy of being told. And so I'm excited about the opportunity. Um, I think that having um, uh, my colleague De Deb Holland uh, as a new Secretary of Interior, first Native American member of any cabinet, um, that would be exciting because there are so many unknown, untold stories that need to be preserved. And I think that she will take that as a very, um, as a very important part of her, her job. And I, I can only imagine that the Biden-Harris administration understands the importance that, um, that, we, that we preserve these very important sites. Um, um, clearly we love our parks, uh, Yellowstone National Park and all those, but historic, preservation of sites that happen in American history are equally as uh, important. Thank you. As I was pointing out to uh, in a panel discussion that we were having this morning, uh, there is, I don't like the word irony. I, I think maybe poetic justice. Um, in 1965, it, there was obviously the Selma to Montgomery March, but in the world of historic preservation, that was uh, when the Rains Committee was started. Congressman Albert Rains from Alabama um, led that committee, and that he that was the beginning of um, the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act. But as I was pointing out to um, in that panel discussion, Rains was also a signatory in 1956 as Southern Manifesto, and he voted in 1957 against the Civil Rights Act, and there is, as I said, poetic justice that now the Historic Preservation Fund, which is uh, through the National Historic Preservation Act, that you are now pushing the preservation of sites, of civil rights sites within that. And wanna thank you for the work and also HBCUs. And wanna thank you for the work that you do on that every year. As you said, you know, I can, you know it, I'm used to watching it. You're used to going to the floor. I can fully expect that when the interior appropriations bill is on the floor, you will be there offering an amendment to increase the funding uh, for civil rights grants. Um, one thing which uh, wanna just 
put in your mind, something to think about moving forward, just an overall increase both in funding and authorization for the HBCUs, because currently the HBCU program is authorized at what it's currently funded at, which is 10 million. And as you know, there's an incredible need for that out there, but also just an increase in funding for um, uh, the Historic Preservation Fund in general. Uh, so, so that uh, people like Clara Nobles with the Alabama Historical Commission both, both have that funding for um, civil rights program, but also for the SHPOs that are so closely involved with that. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like our members to be aware of on the work that you're doing or just uh, general thoughts beyond historic preservation on this Congress? Well, I just want you all to know that, um, you know, my love of history comes honestly. I um, have, um, not only do I grow up in Selma and, and sort of around people who were living history. Um, my very, my, my, as I said, my principal of my high school was Reverend F.D. Reese. And um, I take seriously um, the importance of not only um, the health and well-being of the people that I represent now, but extending and advancing the legacy of the people who so courageously from my district stood up uh, and made this country live up to its ideals of equality and justice for all. I think all historic preservation is important, but I also think that your voices, even um, as we debate, uh, you can't change our history. You can compartmentalize or contextualize that history. And so, you know, um, the never did I think that the cause for which John Lewis and those foot soldiers marched uh, across the bridge 56 years ago. We celebrated uh, just yesterday, the 56th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. Never did I think that I would one day um, as a daughter of Selma be the Alabama's first black Congresswoman um, and my cause would be their cause. That now because of the Shelby versus Holder decision, um, my seminal piece of legislation that I'm uh, that I'm working on is to fully restore the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to its full protections. I think that the work that you all do is so critically important um, in making sure that every generation understands how we got where we are, but most importantly, learning from the past, hopefully not repeating the painful parts of the past, but understanding the strategies and, and, and tactics that were employed in order to um, achieve extraordinary social change. That's something that I'm very proud, Alabama's um, Civil Rights District, Alabama's 7th District that I represent in the halls of Congress every day. I fight for those uh, preservation dollars and will continue to do that um, because I know how important it is. Um, I, I know that for every dollar spent on, um, uh, you know, preserving one of these sites for tourism and other um, people coming to visit these sites, um, that it yields eight or nine economic dollars uh, for those for those places, for those cities and, and those places. And so um, this is a way that we uh, get bang for our buck. Uh, the return on uh, our investment is invaluable uh, when it comes to that. And so continue to keep telling the stories and I will continue to be a big advocate and big supporter of historic preservation and making sure that we um, increase those budgets and give you all uh, more uh, resources to continue to tell our stories. Thank you, Congresswoman Sewell. And please thank your staff for all the work they did behind the scenes to make this happen. And uh, as I said, uh, Congresswoman uh, Laguerre Fernandez, I know that it is even harder uh, to do it under the current circumstances and to carve a little time out uh, to speak with our members. So greatly appreciate you taking the time to do this. So thank you. And also greatly appreciate your comments on the Voting Rights Act because I think that speaks to the, the importance of uh, the history because the, the work that you're doing now, there is also the, the history be behind that and the efforts to push back on the Voting Rights Act, you know, that's certainly done by people who are either ignorant of the history or choosing to bend it uh, for their purposes. So Absolutely. thank you for your time. And and old you. battles have become new again. So that's yes. another reason why we have to know our history, right? Yes. <laughs>
Absolutely. So thank you all. I really appreciate it. And Clara, again, thank you so much for the invitation, all of you. Thank you. Up next, uh, we'll have Representative Dan Newhouse. Uh, while we wait to get him and his staff lined up, uh, Russ Carnahan, are you available to give us a rundown on the Historic Preservation Caucus? There have been a few questions and, and comments in the chat related to the caucus. I wondered if you could give us a, a little yes. overview. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bree. And uh, no, it's so great to hear from the, the two representatives we just heard from and, and, and more to come. Uh, but yeah, the Historic Preservation Caucus, I was honored to be uh, one of the co-chairs uh, during my time in Congress. Um, as you know, uh, Congress is organized into committees uh, formally, uh, but there uh, is also another tool that members use to organize around specific issues, uh, and those are caucuses. Uh, the Historic Preservation Caucus has been around for many years. It's one of the largest caucuses in the Congress, uh, has a, a great number of bipartisan members, and it's really an organizing tool around historic preservation issues. Uh, we have two uh, great bipartisan co-chairs in uh, Congressman Mike Turner from Ohio, the Republican, and Earl Blumenauer, the Democrat from Oregon. Uh, they've been our longtime co-chairs, uh, our great champions. They lead a lot of, of, letter, of funding letters and other initiatives around historic preservation. We're going to be hearing from uh, Congressman Blumenauer uh, during the town hall tomorrow evening. Uh, and also from his uh, lead staffer on historic preservation, uh, John Bosworth, in the panel this afternoon. Uh, so that's what the caucus is. Uh, and again, that they're informal organizations, uh, but they are a great way to organize members around uh, common interest. And we certainly have promoted that in a bipartisan way uh, in the Congress to the benefit of preservation issues and preservation funding. And somebody asked, how does one become a member? Uh, they do not have to be nominated. Uh, again, they are organized through the two co-chairs. It's one of our regular ask uh, during uh, congressional visits each year to ask members to formally join. And they can just send a, uh, they can just communicate with one of the co-chairs that they want to join the caucus is the easiest way to do it. I don't see any other questions on that. Um, uh, Bree, are we uh, close to uh, having the next representative? Thanks, Russ. Uh, we're still trying to get in touch with uh, Representative Newhouse or one of his staffers. Um, so we'll give us just another second here. Uh, while we have Russ on, in the hot seat, uh, does anybody else have any other questions for Russ? The former member of Congress, he's full, full of no, special knowledge. Well, Russ, I, I have a question, I'm not seeing one. Um, can you kind of give us your, your first thoughts on the panel this morning? Um, and, you know, what struck you from, from our panelists this morning? Uh, I think just the, I guess, uh, I, I was struck by uh, really the in-depth knowledge of all the panelists, but uh, especially the kind of growing awareness of, of broadening how we look at preservation uh, to include more uh, diverse voices in preservation to be more representative. And I think that's really been an important and growing movement uh, in preservation. And we heard some uh, some great voices in that regard. And, and so that was really what struck me that you're seeing the really uh, imp those important voices that have, have been around, but I think are, are growing in importance and, and impact. And it's, it's, I think that's a really, that's a really positive thing uh, for preservation. And I think I, I think I see the representative on the screen. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to 
Allison, I believe, uh, yes. for introduction. Yes. Allison Brooks. Yes. Thank you. I'm Dr. Allison Brooks. I am the State Historic Preservation Officer for Washington State. And it is my honor and privilege to be introducing Congressman Dan Newhouse. A little bit of background about Congressman Newhouse. He helped um, together with the Democrats uh, put together legislation for our Heritage Barn Program. It was absolutely bipartisan and it was due to Dan Newhouse's leadership that we were able to get the bill through to create a historic barn program, a heritage barn program here in Washington state. We have almost 800 barns listed on our heritage barn register. And I always like to say, you know, here we have 800 people in rural Washington who voluntarily listed their barn on a government register. How exciting is that? And thanks to Congressman Newhouse, we have given out almost $3 million in grants for the rehabilitation of historic barns in rural Washington. It is such an exciting program. And it really, thanks to Congressman Newhouse, has really connected rural Washington with historic preservation initiatives. It's been amazing. And I wanna give another kudo to Congressman Newhouse. Congressman Newhouse was instrumental in the repatriation of the ancient one known as Kennewick Man to the uh, five claimant tribes. In his district, we have the Yakima Nation and the Wanapum tribe who were part of the five tribes that were desperate to get their elder their relative back to them. And Congressman Newhouse really was instrumental, again, working in a bipartisan manner to get the ancient one returned to his family. And I can't thank him enough for being a part of that. And with that, I would like to turn it over to one of my favorite people, Congressman Dan Newhouse. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brooks. It's a pleasure to see you uh, again. And thanks for all those kind words you had for me. Uh, but as you know, all of these things happen because people work together to make them happen. And I was just privileged to be a part of some of those very important efforts. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for inviting me to speak with you today. Uh, it goes without saying that meeting in person would be preferable, but uh, it's certainly a pleasure to join you in your virtual conference as well. Um, as you all well know, the, the work of preserving uh, uh, the places and the structures that have played important roles in our history and, and, and in the development of our communities, it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, and, and it's something that we're racing against the clock to be able to accomplish. Uh, so I wanna thank each and every one of you for undertaking uh, and being involved in, in these important kinds of efforts. Certainly your hard work uh, allows historic structures to continue standing as symbols of American excellence and to educate um, our future generations about the history of their communities, which I think is so, so important and we could lose so easily. Um, I'm a li lifelong Washingtonian, born and raised in, in the little town of Sunnyside. Uh, I'm a third generation farmer uh, and I'm proud to say not only uh, proud to represent the fourth district of the state of Washington in Congress, but now I am the newly elected chairman of the Congressional Western Caucus. And uh, that's a tremendous opportunity for me to help bring uh, not only the issues important to our state, but uh, to, uh, those issues important to all of Western U United States to the forefront. And through that, uh, I hope to bring my experiences and my uh, commitment uh, towards preserving the, his the history and traditions that we, we have uh, throughout the West, particularly in our rural, rural communities. Um, well, while a lot of historic preservation efforts, I think, are focused on urban areas and big cities, uh, I've often talked about the importance of preserving the traditions of rural America, and I appreciate the work that all of you uh, are doing to make uh, important progress towards that goal. Uh, folks in our part of the country and across the West are well aware of the social uh, implications and, and of the uh, crucial and often thankless role that agricultural communities across uh, America have play in putting food on our, 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 our people's tables. 
Um, many, many folks work on farms uh, uh, that have been part of their family story for generations. Uh, uh, the history of agriculture, even in our state, is, is a long one. And it's something that is, I think, is uh, worth telling. Um, uh, all of this is very much worth preserving. By safeguarding the structures that have supported and enabled the rural American way of life, where we are honoring and acknowledging the important role that uh, all of those folks have played in our nation's history. And as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Brooks, I'm very proud of the fact that I had a small role to play uh, in establishing the Heritage Barn Grant Program. And I'm just delighted to see the tremendous success that, uh, that it is enjoyed, uh, thanks in large part to your leadership uh, after passing that legislation. So uh, I wanna give you some kudos as well for the, for the uh, tremendous amount of work that's been done and, and the, um, the, the great record, the track record that you've established in, in completing the work uh, of, of preserving all of, those, all of those structures around the state. It's truly an amazing thing. Um, uh, as you know, this, this program not only preserves our history and our, and our agricultural tradition, but it ensures that future generations uh, will be able to witness firsthand the, the places and the spaces uh, where their ancestors de developed a world-class agricultural industry and carry on the traditions of rural America into the future. So thank you for your, all of you, for your role in helping uh, rural America continue to maintain and pass on their traditions. I'm optimistic that there are people who are so dedicated to the cause of pre preserving rural traditions, and I look forward to continued opp opportunities for us to work together into the future. Um, so thank you for having me uh, visit with you just, just a few minutes today. And I, I, and I hope that the rest of your conference is, is, uh, is goes, goes along very well and, and that very educational as well as enjoyable. So thank you all. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Congressman Newhouse. And something that I've been asking you for is, is there any way to bring our uh, amazing Heritage Barn program in Washington state to a national oh. level? Well, you know, that's a tremendous idea. I, I'm, I'm sure that there are still a, a lot of uh, barns in need of preservation throughout the country. And I would think due to the success of our program and the way, the way that people have uh, participated enthusiastically, and we, we can show the results of what, uh, uh, what can happen in other states. So yeah, let's do that. I'm all in. That's great to hear. And I think um, Eric Heim from Nixpo just said, barn funding is literally the number one most requested inquiry in that the National Conference of Shippos receives. So yes, I think our program could be a model. And it's just been, you know, Congressman, when we've um, listed barns on our Heritage Barn Register, you literally see farmers in tears that somebody has recognized their work, their work to save the state's heritage, their work to save their family's heritage, their work to save the rural landscape. And it's just so fulfilling to see, see our rural heritage, the citizens in our rural communities being honored. Yeah, it's an exciting thing. And it truly is an important part of, you know, of preserving our past. And, and so uh, let's, uh, I love the idea. I'm, I'm very excited about the bringing so, an idea like that forward to the rest of the country. So, uh, and, and plus it gives us an, another opportunity to work together with all of you. So I, I'm excited great. about that too. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good. I'm going to turn this back over to Ted. Thank you, Congressman Newhouse, and uh, please thank uh, your staff, uh, Samantha, Elizabeth, and uh, Jess uh, for making this happen, and greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. Good to see you. Appreciate it. Uh, Take care, sir. Bye-bye.